Ja. Mama Mia. Oh, it's 11 o'clock. Look at that. Now, instead of calling this a sound test, I feel inclined to just record, just for the charm and beauty of having the chiming in the podcast. What do you think, Randy? Are we ready? Of course I'm not ready. I'm never ready. When the fuck have I ever been ready? Have I ever recorded an episode of this podcast where I was ready? When the fuck has that happened, honestly? You can scream and shout with all your might. Oh, you can scream, shout, whine, cry, snivel, piss, and motherfucking moan. Oh my god, I said a bad word. You can shove your opinion up your ass that way Obama's cock has something to keep it company. And don't forget, the ever-present and the most likely third possibility, you are wrong and I am right. Welcome, my friends. Welcome, my enemies. I am the Great One himself from the Cynical Libertarian Society, and this is the Stating the Obvious podcast, the weapons platform from which I launched the cruise missile of my intellect, homes in on and destroys, absolutely fucking devastates with nuclear power, all motherfucking stupid status around me. If there are survivors glowing in the dark from exposure to radiation, we mow them down with a machine gun. Why is my fucking phone blinking? What is this shit? Why am I getting email? Why? Why do I give it? Who? Who is bothering me? Alright, it's not important. Good. I like when shit's not important, because I have stuff to do. Like, for example, recording this podcast. I've been fucking off lately. We all know that, right? This is not a big deal. What the fuck? Interesting. I've been fucking off, and I've also not been fucking off. I've been working on some websites, some of my websites, doing a little bit of a revitalization. And I need to do a little touching up on the Cynical Libertarian Society website as well. And I really need you guys to fucking give me some name, the name coins so I can buy a fucking dot bit server. Of course, first I have to get a name coin address on there. To those of you who have sent the bitcoins, thank you. The address for sending bitcoins is on the website. Your bitcoin donations go towards keeping the site up and running. I'm not intending to get rich on this, but God damn it, if I can just use it somehow down the road to pay for the server. That reminds me, where the fuck is bitcoin? All right, stop, ooh, shiny object. All right, stop getting distracted, great one. Stop fucking getting distracted. Weather here in the People's Republic of Fort Collins has been really nice lately, so I've been getting some outdoor time. Pretty soon it will be trail running time again. Yes. Looking forward to that. Anyway, none of that has anything to do with anarchy. What the fuck's going on here? Well, I am the great one himself from the Cynical Libertarian Society, C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com on the internet. And in the control room over there on the other side of the glass is the lovely and adorable Randy. She's hanging out doing her thing, mostly keeping me on track and giving me shit and occasionally bending over so I can look at her ass. And this is a Stating the Obvious podcast where I state the obvious, where I talk about anarcho-capitalism, statism, and just whatever the fuck I want to talk about. If you want to send us an email, the email address is God, that's dog spelled backwards, G-O-D, at cynlibsoc.com. For those of you who are stupid, cynlibsoc.com. Those are the first three letters of each of the words Cynical Libertarian Society because nobody the fuck wants to type in cynicallibertariansociety.com because even I would fuck that up. I That's just way too much typing. All the good domain names are gone. I've been trying to find a domain name to do a customized short link. And God damn it. It's like, Fuck. Finding a good domain name is really difficult. That's another just whole story. I spent hours on that in the last couple of days. I spent hours on a lot of shit in the last couple of days, including chicks and little hippie girls. All right, anyway, I didn't fill up my water bottle. Good move. I should keep, you know, Randy, I should keep, wait a minute, I do have emergency water in here. 
I should keep emergency water in the recording room. In what do you call this? The studio. Studio. That's what it's called. All these technical terms. Oh, actually, I do have emergency water supplies in here. They're really old. We. Shit, I need to rotate my emergency water supplies. I haven't done that in months. All right, anyway. It has nothing to do with what I'm supposed to be talking about. I don't know what I'm supposed to be talking about. Oh, I need to make a note about this. I read, I haven't had a chance to research this yet. Uh, NSA. Yes, I was making notes there. I read, and I haven't had to, had a chance to do any background research on this yet, so I'm not going to talk about it too much until I know a little bit more. I know it's a strange concept not talking about things you don't know anything about. Most of you don't really grasp that. Anyhow, I read on the internet, so it must be true, that the NSA was sitting up websites that impersonate Facebook and getting people to sign into them so as to install spyware on people's computers. This is awesome shit. The thing to me that's more shocking than that, not shocking, shocking's the wrong word. The part of that that I find disgusting is not the fact that the NSA would do this, that they would create fake Facebook servers and install spyware on people's computers. I mean, there's nothing surprising about that or dis even disgusting. Or I mean, this is what I would expect from the NSA and from the federal government and from the state. I mean, this is, this is what they do. That's how they roll. The part of it that is the truly disgusting part to me is how few people will care. First of all, most people who will just disbelieve that it happened, they'll say it's a conspiracy theory. And even if the ones who do the ones who do believe it, even if they believe this actually happened, well they'll just justify it because of course Obama is the president and this is the most transparent administration ever. And so if Obama really did do that, if the government really did that while Obama was the president, well, then it must be necessary, right? It must be absolutely necessary. Just today, I got into a discussion with some people, and a podcast or two ago, I talked about the stupid time zone change. Oh, my God. It's like I'm still fucked up. My sleep cycle is so destroyed from between doing late night theater gigs last week and then having that hour stolen from me because of this stupid daylight savings time shit. My sleep cycle is still destroyed. And I was in a discussion this morning with some people and they were bitching about the time change because have you noticed everybody, everybody bitches about the time change yet you notice everybody does it. This is statism. This is slavery, right? This is like, well, I sure do hate going out there to pick that cotton, but the massa says I got to go pick cotton, so I'm going to go pick cotton. It's like, hold it, dude. There's like 60 of you slaves on this plantation, and there's seven white guys. Just beat the shit out of them, but they won't do it because they've been conditioned to be slaves. It's when the Nazis came for the Jews, I've talked about this a gazillion times. You see the pictures. There's all these Jews getting on the trains. And there's like 20 Nazis with machine guns. And there's 300 Jews. Just beat the shit out of them and take their machine guns. But what did the Jews do? Well, they got on the fucking train. Because they had been conditioned to be slaves. In our society, right now, today, 2014, United States of America, right here, in the People's Republic of Colorado, the government says, move your clock forward by an hour. What does everybody do? They move their clock forward by an hour. Because everybody's conditioned to be a slave. At this same discussion, you know what else came up as a topic? about how we, and the word we was used, I love when people use the word we like this, how we put the American Indians on reservations which are made up of the shittiest land in the United States. I have never put 
an Indian on a reservation. I just want to be clear about that. Your democratically elected government did that. And what's really funny is somebody says, well, I wonder if these people ever want to get off of the reservations and have things like electricity and Facebook. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, maybe, but they've been conditioned over all these years to live in poverty and to be slaves. Just like people in ghettos have been conditioned to live in poverty and be slaves. Just like people here in the People's Republic of Fort Collins have been conditioned to move their clocks forward by an hour for a reason that nobody can fucking understand and be slaves. You have been conditioned to be a slave. That's why you accept the NSA installing spyware on your computer. That's why you accept Obama murdering people in foreign countries with flying robots. That's why you accept paying income taxes. I gotta, fuck, I gotta do income tax sometime. Christ! Randy, what day is this? It is. Yes, it's, by the way, it's March the, thank you, March the 13th, 2014. Great, I got 30 fucking days to get around to doing my income taxes because I've been conditioned to be a slave and because I know that if I don't pay money to the federal government so that it can keep spying on people and killing people, I know that the federal government will come and kill me. Land of the free, home of the brave. Only in your fantasies. More like land of the slaves, home of the chicken shit. All right, Randy, watch the spikes because I'm going to make sure the microphone is plugged in all the way. All right, beautiful. We're good. I have a pile of shit here. I still have this giant pile of shit on the floor. What am I going to call this if it doesn't matter? Squirrel. Shiny object. Oh, I'm distracted. Let me read this. Let's talk about some. Let's talk about some stuff. Let me work on getting this pile off of my floor. Let's talk about getting her clothes on my floor. Oh, sorry. I'm really horny lately, so that's probably going to crop up a lot. Anyway, girls, they're cute. All right. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I know. Did you see that other one? The one with the twirly things? Yes. Yes, I have some twirly things. Oh my god, so I'm at the Oh my god, like totally. Like oh my god. Alright, like oh my god. <laughs> oh, I gotta tell you guys this story. So I'm at the bar the other day with my friends. We're, we're playing dominoes because that's what as old people do, you know. Back when we were your age, we didn't have video games. We had to walk uphill to play dominoes. So we had all walked uphill in the snow and we were playing dominoes. And the waitress comes by and she's been terrified already because one of the guys I played dominoes with, he's one of these people who he has this habit of anytime you ask him a question, it's like, he, he always answers yes. Like the waitress will say, do you want french fries or onion rings? And he will say yes. And so anyhow, way back in the day when this waitress was new and first started working the shift, because we're always in the same bar at the same time every week. Same day, same time. So we always get the same waitress unless the schedules change. So when she first started this is awesome. I have four dimensional glasses here. They're like the 3D glasses, but they're the 4D. And when you put them on, everything looks really freaky. I need to figure out what I can do with these. I wonder if there's a way to do like 4D photography. There's got to be a, a way of doing that. Anyway, it has nothing. To, I was telling a story. Squirrel! And where was I? Oh, yeah. So the waitress. So the like, first time we got her, maybe the second time, this guy terrified the shit out of her by just being himself, which means having a sense of humor and a personality. Which is the sort of thing that a lot of younger women 
in the United States right now can't handle. If you're a man and you have a sense of humor and a personality and more than three brain cells, this terrifies the shit out of them because they don't have a sense of humor and they can't comprehend it. So anyhow, he did that. He terrified the shit out of her. So she's been incredibly skittish of us for the last two or three months. So whenever she comes to the table, it's like walking on eggshells. Plus, she smells like a hippie. Anyway, last time we're there, we're doing her thing, and she comes up, and she says, is there anything else I can get you guys? Or something like that. And I said, yes, I am Cornholio. I must have TP for my bunghole. And I thought this poor girl was going to piss in her pants. So that is the power of the bunghole. The bunghole can make people pee on themselves and terrify the shit out of them. I've been watching Beavis and Butthead lately. So that's, I keep wanting to go out and try Beavis and Butthead pick up lines, right? Like, oh, come to Butthead. <laughs> yeah, we're going to score. But it's just so pathetic. So I watched. <laughs> okay. Yes, this is me reading an art. This is me reading this newspaper article and responding to it. I watched two of my favorite Beavis and Butthead episodes ever. <laughs> the first one is the one where they're selling candy for to raise money for the school. As old people remember doing this. Actually, I never did it. I remember it happening. I never sold candy because that was too much work. I'm going to do that. Besides, giving me a giant box of chocolate, right? Like I'm not going to eat it anyway. Beavis and Butthead got the boxes of chocolate to go sell to raise money for their school. And somehow or another, they managed, oh, so you go to the first place, and they're like, yeah, they're $2 each. And the guy's like, well, do I buy it from you, or do I buy it, do I buy it from Beavis, or buy it from Butthead? And so finally, he says, tell you what, you know, they're like, well, I'll sell you, well, one of them, one of the guys says, well, I'll sell you my candy bar for a dollar instead of two. And then the other Beavis Butthead guy says, well, no, I'll sell you mine for a dollar also. So he says, great. So he gives each of them a dollar and gets a candy bar from each of them. So now each of them have a dollar. And at this point, Beavis buys a candy bar from Butthead for a dollar. Then Butthead buys a candy bar from Beavis for two dollars. Then Beavis buys a candy bar from Butthead for two dollars. Then Butthead buys a candy bar from Beavis for two dollars. And the same two dollars just goes back and forth and they sit there and eat the entire two boxes of candy. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, there it is. There is a huge chunk of the so-called economy in the United States of America explained right there. It always amazes me when I work for companies where if you work for the company and you want something else from somebody who works at the company, you actually have to pay for them to come and do it. Right? I understand your department, for example, paying for materials, right? Like if my department wants IT department to install a new computer. Okay, I can understand my department has to pay for the computer. But the idea that my department has to pay the person from your department to come put the computer in. It's like the $2 going back and forth between Beavis and Butthead as they eat the candy. And there's just all sorts of areas in our economy where this thing happens. And of course, the reason it happens and the reason it's encouraged is because in our economy, to come back to the income taxes, every time, you know, Beavis and Butthead are just passing that $2 back and forth and eating the candy. But in our economy, whenever we pass this money back and forth, it's being taxed. And that's why it's so critical to get this money being passed back and forth. And that's, of course, why it's so critical to get more people in the workplace and to get more... <sighs> Yeah, to, I mean, just to get more people in the workplace. Because the more people who are working for money above the board, and the more the money is being passed around above the board, the more taxes. The other, hold on, squirrel, shiny object. Let me see if this is important. I know, I need to just stop. Oh, no. Oh, teenagers, they crack me up. I'm going to turn, I'm turning the cell phone off. Look at me, Randy. I'm turning the cell phone off. Yes. There it is. Squirrel! All right. <laughs> the other great Beavis and Butthead episode. My favorite of all time. Because this one also perfectly illustrates the federal government. They wanted to buy nachos. And they only had a dollar. And Butthead... I mean, yeah. No, Beavis. Beavis is like, 
oh man, wouldn't it be great if there's like like a place we could go and they had like this magic machine and yeah, we could just like make more money and just like put money in and then more money would come out and we'd just have more, more money, money, more, more, and more money. And Butthead is looking over Beavis's shoulder and sees the copy store. He says, hold on, Beavis, I have an idea. And so they go in the photocopy store and they photocopy a dollar bill and a nickel <laughs> and cut them out. And then they go and they try, and they try to spend. <laughs> and they try to spend the photocopy dollar bills at the Quickie Mart or whatever it's called. And. <laughs> <laughs> and Beaver, oh, and Butthead has the the photocopy dollar bills, and he's like trying to pick up this chick. Hey, baby, I got money. <laughs> <laughs> and Beavis has the photocopied nickels. <laughs> it's a photocopy of a nickel. <laughs> oh, oh man! And it's like there's the Federal Reserve. We need some more money. We'll just print some up. Oh, you can learn things from watching cartoons. Not as you can't learn as much from Beavis and Butthead as you can from South Park, which is still possibly the greatest social political commentary of the modern United States that's ever been done, as far as I'm concerned. And speaking of television, speaking of watching television, how far? Are we into this? Great. We're 21 minutes into the podcast, and I still haven't actually talked about anything of substance. Good to know I haven't lost my touch after not recording an episode of Stating the Obvious for two weeks or more, however long it's been. I don't know how long it's been. It's been a while. Anyhow, talent like mine just never fades. Speaking of television series, I just started re-watching what is, without a doubt... Hang on a second, I'm opening the window. Squirrel! Let's a little sunlight in. Ah, I'm a vampire! Right, because this way I turned off the cell phone so I wouldn't get distracted. Now I'll open the window so that when the little college girls walk back and forth, I can get distracted. Next week is... Next week is spring break, right? Yeah, yeah, because my friend in high school, she's on spring break this week. Right, yes, she's in New York. So anyhow, spring break, spring break is next week, so we'll be short college girls. i got to look at them now. Anyway, the fuck was I talking? Oh, yes! The greatest television series ever created. And no, it's not in the original Star Trek, although original Star Trek is close. If you guys have not seen this, you need to watch it. All Creatures Great and Small. It is a TV series, is made by the BBC, well, it's made in England, I can't say for sure it was made by the BBC. And it's based on the book, All Creatures Great and Small, and the subsequent three other books in the series, written by James Harriet. He was a veterinarian in Derby in England, and this was back, I don't, I don't remember exactly what year it starts in, but it's prior to World War II. The books are absolutely fantastic. And the television series, which I have watched all the way through three times, and am now embarking on my fourth journey through the series. The television series is absolutely brilliant. It is everything that television really isn't anymore. Because I was thinking about this yesterday, and like I know one of the things that's real popular right now on TV series is... Orange is the New Black. Okay, now I've never seen an episode of this. All I know about it, my understanding, and this could be wrong because I haven't seen the series. My understanding is that it's about a woman who somehow or another something happens and she goes to prison. And thus the series takes place. It's essentially her exploits in prison. So here we have a television series. Let's go back to people being conditioned to be slaves. Here we have a television series which is about a woman who did something, and I'm sure she isn't a rapist, a murderer, or an arsonist, or a child molester, so whatever she did, I'm willing to bet it wasn't that bad. 
It's a TV series about a woman being put in a cage by the government. It's a TV series about a woman who accepts that she is a slave, that she is the property of the government, and that the government can put her into a cage and she will willingly comply with going into that cage. This is how you people learn to be slaves, is by watching shit like that. All Creatures Great and Small, on the other hand, features very little of the state. When the state does appear, it's usually... I mean, sometimes the state appears favorably, of course. Sometimes it appears disfavorably. But for the most part, it's just the story of James Harriet and Siegfried Farnan and later on Tristan Farnan, these three veterinarians in a country town trying to run their business and take care of the animals and to, you know, to interact with the farmers who are trying to run their farms and take care of their animals and make money. And it's just all these people going about their lives, not trying to kill other people with flying robots, not wanting to start wars, not wanting to ban cigarettes, not wanting to censor what other people see and read, not wanting to ins install spyware on people's computers. It's just this story of all these people in and around Derby going about their lives and being happy. And the series, it's wonderfully filmed, it's wonderfully acted, it's wonderfully written. The dialogue and everything is taken straight from the books. Usually when you see a TV series or a movie that's based on a book, right? The movie, like, uh, what do you call it? Oh! The, yeah, yeah, Katniss, the, the Mockingbird, the Flaming, the Fire, the... Fuck! Hunger Games! I haven't read Hunger Games yet. I'm intending to read it because one of my friends read the books and she said they were really good and she liked them. So I'm intending to read it. But I'm sure that the Hunger Games movie was not much the same as the Hunger Games book. I know that just from common sense. The TV series, All Creatures Great and Small, draws directly from the books. I mean, reading the books is like reading a transcript of the TV show because the TV show, when they wrote the TV show based on the books, they didn't, you know, add gratuitous sex and they didn't add explosions and they didn't add time-traveling robots and they didn't add all this other shit in order to jazz it up because it wasn't made for a short attention span, stupid slavery audience like the ones you have now. So yeah, if you have never seen All Creatures Great and Small, and if you're interested in seeing some quality television, some quality storytelling, some acting skills, and some stories that will make you laugh and cry, all in the same episode, and that will give you hope for the future, and will give you, you know, will let you, will make you realize that just because most people are fucking too stupid to even be allowed to live. There have been people in the past who were good people, who were intelligent people, and that people left on their own just might be able to survive without a government to install spyware on their computers, and without a government to put them in cages. It just might be possible. I know it's really hard for you to believe because you're a slave, but it could happen. But it's a great television series. And I honestly, I cannot recommend this TV series enough. If you don't watch much television because you think shit stuff on television is shit, and it is shit, I agree, most of it. Not that I watch that much anymore, which makes me a lot happier. This series is wonderful. All creatures, great and small. Read the books. Books are wonderful. TV series, wonderful. All right. Where are we at? Yes, 29 minutes into it. Let's start talking about something. I'm supposed to be talking... Now I don't have time to do anything because I rambled too long. Oh, squirrel! Shiny object! All right, here we go. This is from the Rocky Mountain Collegian. <clears throat> Why is college so expensive? That's the headline here. This is written by a college student. It's written by the Collegian Editor-at-Large, Daniel Sewell. 
why is college so expensive? <laughs> so here's the real reason. College is expensive because you're willing to pay that much for it, right? If this is how pricing on anything works, why is stuff expensive? Okay, first of all, there's there's market pricing and then there is God, what's the what's the word for the opposite of market pricing? There's fuck, I don't know. Right offhand, I need to think about this. There's there's market pricing where the consumer pays the full cost, okay? The opposite of this is I don't know what it's called right this minute. I mean I have to think about this. It's a system where the purchaser is insulated and isolated from the actual cost of what is being purchased. Okay, the classic example of this, and this has been explained ad nauseum by me and by other people, is the healthcare system. Why does healthcare cost so much money? Well, because of insurance. When you have health insurance, you don't pay the full cost of your, say, I don't know, whatever, gallbladder surgery, right? You're isolated, <clears throat> excuse me, you're isolated from that. So the insurance company serves as this barrier between you and the hospital and the insurance company, which of course now you have to give them your money thanks to Obamacare, everybody has health care. Oh wait, we don't actually have health care, we just have to buy health insurance. And of course, having health insurance doesn't actually mean you have health care. It just means that you're giving money to multi-billion dollar corporations. Because of course, Obama, well, he doesn't like corporations and he's for the poor people. That's why he's forcing the poor people to buy health care from, excuse me, health insurance, not health care. He's forcing them to buy health insurance from the corporations because he cares about poor people so much. Anyhow. With health insurance, being as they are this barrier between you and the hospital and you pay the health insurance corporation so much money and then they pay the hospital so much money, there's no incentive for you to do any negotiating with hospitals, to shop around for the best price, anything else. And of course, there's no incentive for the hospitals to try to manage their cost because they can throw any fucking cost at the health insurance corporations and the health insurance corporations are going to pay it because they don't give a shit. They just raise the premiums. So that's why that doesn't work. So why is college so expensive? Well, for pretty much exactly the same reason. People who go to college, most of them, not all of them by any stretch, but most of them get loans. And of course, interestingly enough, as I've learned after some research, with student loans, there is actually no money being loaned. And the way that works is the student goes to the loan institute, the loan institute then guarantees that the student will pay the money back but the stu but there's not really any money that well, there's the money goes from the loan institute to the college but that money is just sort of fake money it's not real money there's not like real dollar bills or something it's just electronic money and then the college takes that money and spends it and then when the student pays back the student loans that's the first time real actual money is factored into this. And so student loans are essentially, they're like credit cards, right? I've explained this before. If you get a credit card, you have a $2,000 limit on that credit card. You go out and you buy $2,000 worth of the stuff, well, there's no real money involved. You just created $2,000, which you now have to pay back to the bank because the bank is saying, okay, look, we're good for this $2,000 because the person who has a credit card is going to pay it back. There's not like when you get a credit card with a $2,000 limit, the bank that gave you that credit card doesn't take 20 $100 bills and put them in an account attached to that credit card. There is no money behind that credit card. Spending $2,000 on that credit card is just making money out of thin air. 
Student loans work exactly the same way. If you go to college and you get, say, a $10,000 loan for your tuition this year, the bank that gave that loan to you and then sends this money to the college, they didn't actually take $10,000 worth of $100 bills and give it to the college or put it in an account or something. That money is just created out of nowhere. And that's why when the college education bust happens, just like the housing bubble burst, when the college education bubble burst, which it's going to do, and it's going to happen in the very near future, I easily within 10 years, possibly within five, that's a prediction. I should probably write that down and put that on the prediction page. Oh, college edu bubble in five to 10 years. Okay, that'll go on the prediction page. I've made that prediction officially. When the college education bubble does burst, they're going to be, and we already see that. We we already see it happening. This is why I, this is not really a prediction. This is like saying, okay, water is going to run downhill when you pour it out of the pitcher. I mean, this really isn't a fucking prediction because we already see it. Look how many people you know that have college degrees that are either unemployed or work as baristas. Okay, college degrees are becoming more and more worthless every single time a class of people graduates. Classes in a school class, cl not classes in upper class, middle class, lower class. And it's becoming more and more difficult for them to pay back their loans. And when all of these loans that aren't being paid back finally reach critical mass, just like they did with the housing bubble, there is going to be a massive financial collapse. Because these people who have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars worth of student debt, racking up God knows how much interest every year, who are working as baristas, they can't pay this. They can't. And when all of this shit blows up, it's going to be a really big mess. All right, so we're 37 minutes into the podcast. Let's start talking about what I'm supposed to talk about. Squirrel! I guess that was what I'm supposed to talk about because the topic is, why is college so expensive? So let's read this to you. This is written by a college student. This is written by somebody who's paying for this expensive college. All right, here we go. There has been a lot of talk about issues in higher education. One of the most common complaints is that the cost is too high. But should students really be complaining? What? <laughs> oh. Of course not. You should be good little slaves. You should pay that money to all those old white people who are sitting around doing nothing because they can't get jobs in the private sector and do anything productive. That's why they teach at colleges. All right. <clears throat> What students get to experience is a luxurious life that is reserved for only 6% of the world, which is a statistic provided by CSU's own Dr. Elizabeth Williams, a communication studies professor. Okay, Elizabeth Williams is a communication studies professor. That means she cannot be employed in the free market, in the private sector, where she would actually have to produce something because communications studies is completely fucking useless and meaningless. I'm doing a goddamn podcast. Anybody anywhere on the planet fucking Earth can listen to this. I don't need a communications studies diploma. Okay, the days when you needed a fucking diploma to talk are over with. Anybody can talk, anybody can write, anybody can communicate. So you see, you shouldn't be complaining about the cost because look at this luxurious life you're getting in return for this money. And this is a big problem with the whole college thing is that so many of you out there do not recognize, and if you're getting ready to go to college, you really need to be listening to this. You people do not recognize that college, see, they talk about this as if college is a luxury good. Well, you're spending, college should be, college is, must be, has to be looked at as an investment. 
when you're spending this money to go to college, you're not spending that money to live a luxurious life. You're spending that money to get a skill set which in theory is going to pay off in the future by allowing you to earn more money. The idea that you're paying to go to college to have a luxurious lifestyle is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's, well, it's not ridiculous in the sense that people are doing it. I mean, look at how many people think, oh, college, it's about the experience. No, no, it's about the investment. And if you're making a bad investment, if you are, for example, majoring in journalism or communications or hyphenated studies or anything liberal arts, then you're making a really, really bad investment. The money you spent on college, instead of spending it on college, you could have, my God, get the same money and put it in the stock market. Get the same money and start a business. Get the same money and, well, I don't, shouldn't say buy a home. That's over and done with. Housing market is going to be out of action for a long time. But you're not paying for college to have a luxurious lifestyle. If you want to have a luxurious lifestyle, just stay at home with your fucking parents. If you want to have a luxurious lifestyle, go to prison. Because orange is the new black. Universities provide amazing amenities, cutting-edge research opportunities, and carefully coordinated classes. The resources provided to students are supposed to guarantee a successful career upon graduation. Yes, carefully coordinated classes. Carefully controlled classes where you don't learn anything that would make you dangerous to the state. And, of course, carefully coordinated classes that never offer the fucking class you want when you want it. I remember going to CSU. I remember. I know a shit tons of other people who go to CSU. The fucking classes you need are never offered when you can fucking take them. I hear this all the time from people. I needed this, but I couldn't get it. Or, yeah, I need this class. The only one available was 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, fuck. Yeah, they're carefully coordinated, all right. Amenities, such as the Recreation Center, Lori Student Center, Health Network, Parts of Athletics, Veterans Programs, ASCSU, Buses, Counseling, Student Activities, Computer Labs, Wi-Fi, and Construction are paid by student fees. Wow, you get all of those things. Let's see, Recreation Center. That's called outside. You can get that for free. Lori Student Center. That's a place to hang out and socialize with people. That's outside. You can get that for free. Health Network. Well, Obamacare passed. Everybody has free health care now. Why would you need a health network? And plus, you can ride your parents' health insurance until you're 26. Why the fuck do you need a health network? Parts of, parts of athletics. I really don't even know what the fuck that means. Parts of athletics. I think they mean your student fees go to pay for the football team. I am reading the book King of Sports, which is all about football, college football and NFL, and a little bit about high school. It is incredibly revealing. I mean, everybody knows the levels of financial corruption within football. But I did not realize the sheer magnitude. For example, did you know the NFL is a nonprofit and doesn't have to pay taxes? Did you know that college football programs are nonprofits and don't have to pay taxes? I mean, the sheer fucking level of corruption. I got to remember to get that book on the reading list. Let me put that on my notes. King of Sports on reading list. The, the magnitude of the financial corruption. Oh, and apparently in the NFL, so to be like vested in the NFL to get full quote unquote, benefits, and I, I'm, I'm going off memory, so I can't be real specific because I don't want to fuck it up. But you need to be in football. I think it's five years in the NFL before you get 
like retirement or whatever. I, I don't quote me on this. Okay. But you get more benefits after you've been there for X number of years. And so oddly enough, the NFL gets rid of a huge number of football players when they're one year short of reaching the point where they would get all the additional benefits. I mean, just the fuck. Oh my God. Just read this book. Read this fucking book. Especially if you're a football fan. The level of corruption in the NFL and college football is beyond even what I thought it was. And I'm the one I've been saying for years about how the NFL, how the Super Bowl is rigged ahead of time, how they already know who's going to win, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's obvious. But just, oh my God, the amount of corruption is mind-blowing. Read the book, King of Sports. I forgot who wrote it. Anyway, it'll be on the reading list. I'm going to add it to the reading list. It's on my notes. And as we know, right, Randy, whenever I make notes, everything on my to-do list always gets done, right? Yes. You people should see my to-do list. I'm not joking. My to-do list is a three-wing... <laughs> a three-wing. It's three wings. It has three wings on it. It's incredibly aerodynamic with its three wings. My reading list, we'll try that again, is a three ring binder with about two inches worth of paper in it. That's my to-do list. So yes. All right. The veterans program. Well, if we weren't killing people in foreign countries and making war, we wouldn't have any veterans. What a fucking concept. ASCSU, that's the CSU government, because of course, you know, you see, CSU has to have a student government so that, because you have to teach the slaves early that having somebody else tell them what to do with their life is a valid way that, for them to live. So we have a student government at CSU to help teach the slaves that government is so important. And they're just out for your best look. They're, they're looking out for your best interest. That's why they're installing spyware on your computer for you, to keep you safe. Buses, are the, the, the whole bus system in the People's Republic of Fort Collins is a giant fucking joke. And counseling, why, why do people in college need counseling? Why are people so fucked? I know kids in high school who already have counselors, who already go to fucking therapy. When I was your age, and this is the fucking truth, when I was your age, therapy was called outside. A few people would fucking get off the Facebook and just go outside and get some fucking exercise and some fresh air and some sunshine. I know, I've never, you've never heard this before on this podcast. Fucking eat some decent food, stop eating junk food, fucking learn how to not be friends with people who are psychic vampires. And get some fresh air, sunshine, and sunshine, sunshine, and exercise, and you will not need fucking therapy. You need therapy because you're idiots. Computer labs, because nobody today has their own fucking computer. I mean, you can get a computer anywhere. Wi-Fi. Oh, shit, you can't find any Wi-Fi other than in every restaurant and coffee shop in the fucking planet, on the fucking planet. And the ones in the planet, down in Middle Earth. If you go to the coffee shops down in the planet at Middle Earth, you can still get Wi-Fi there. And, of course, construction fees because we got to have lots of construction on campus. They've been rebuilding the Laurie Student Center for I don't know how long. It feels like years. It pisses me off because Ramskeller, Ramskeller is closed. All right. What? Holy shit. Thank you. Randy is pointing out that we're running out of time, and I'm only halfway through this article. See, this is what she's here for. Somebody's got to keep me in line. Squirrel. All right, here we go. The cost of tuition primarily goes to professors, people who can't get jobs in the free market. Classrooms. I've been in CSU classrooms. They're giant pieces of shit that are falling apart with crappy furniture. Libraries. The library is nice. I'll give you that. They built this giant study cube that is ridiculous. It's this big giant cube out on the plaza. You're supposed to go in there and study. They call it the study cube. But it has glass walls. So all you, I, I couldn't study in there because I'd be looking out the giant glass walls, people watching everybody in the plaza. There's no way I could study in that thing. And advising. Here's a question. Why do college students need advising? Aren't they the smartest generation ever? Don't they have Google? 
What, what could they possibly need advice on? Well, they know everything. Maintenance, custodians, ownership, operations, administration, scholarships, and student services also play. And none of that would exist if there wasn't a college. So basically, you're paying all of this money to all of these people to support the luxury of you having this nice, luxurious place. Again, if you want a life of luxury, just live with your parents. Why are you taking out student loans to have a life of luxury? Okay. While CSU does not publish statistics regarding employment, which is odd because CSU is a public university owned by the government, but of course we're not going to publish any statistics that might embarrass us. Okay. While CSU does not publish statistics regarding employment upon graduation, the overall unemployment rate is daunting and it seems that those with a degree are not immune. Oh, really? You think because there's a college education bubble coming? So yes, CSU, come here. You'll get a diploma and get a job. Oh, but we don't actually publish any statistics about what employment rates are for our graduates. So the whole selling point of college is supposed to be if you get a diploma, you can get a job. So you would think people would want to know how many people with a diploma get a job. Conveniently, CSU does not provide that information or keep those statistics. But, but, we go back to reading. There's always a but. But, could that just be a result of uninvolved students who do not understand they have to proactively search for a career path instead of expecting to be handed, ex instead of expecting a job to be handed to them? Wait a minute. How can these students not know that they have to actively seek a career path? They have. 12 years of public education. They have at least four years of college if they have a diploma. They're the smartest generation ever. They have Google. How can they not know that they have to go look for a job instead of expecting it to be handed to them? I don't understand how this works. What the fuck did they learn in 12 years of public education and four years of college? At no point, none of these people, none of all these professors and teachers who are so goddamn smart and these students are paying them all this fucking money, nobody sat them down and just explained to them, you have to go look for a job. And this is the smartest generation ever. This is a college degree. This is a college diploma. And nobody told me I have to go look for a job? I don't bother with the other side. Oh my God. There is a college girl out the window wearing awesome boots and tight jeans. Fuck yes. Shiny. To that. <laughs> Come to butthead. <laughs> oh my god, she is shiny. That is sweet. And she probably doesn't know that she has to actually go look for a job. Nobody's explained that to her. 12 years of public education. At this point, she looks 20-ish. So, at least a year of college, maybe two years of college. Nobody has explained to her that she's not just going to magically get a job when she graduates. She has to look for the job. No one's told her that. I need to start a fucking service where I explain to college students obvious shit that they should have learned. Oh, wait. Oh, there's a movie. Yes. Alright, I'm out. I'm gonna go check out the college girl. See you guys in the next podcast. And not surprisingly, yeah, <laughs> I'm back. And not surprisingly, she's got her fucking cell phone in her hand and she's talking. Put down the fucking cell phone. Okay, put down the fucking cell phones. Says the guy who was podcasting and getting distracted by his cell phone. <laughs>